this is the last time I played roulette. I turned two, yeah, two grand. I was in my swing shorts, uh, and I turned two grand into five hundred thousand at the roulette in the win. And all the security guys were ringing up, and it was it was one of those situations. It was great, and um, by the and then I thought, well, maybe I can win like a couple of million or something. And so I was pressing, and I was every spin was I had forty thousand dollars on the table yeah. for every spin, and um, then I had three losing spins. And I welcome to the Lockdown Life Podcast. My name is Jamie Flynn. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at jam underscore fly. All podcasts are available on our YouTube channel. And while you are there, I would appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button. Welcome to the Lockdown Live podcast. My guest today is the founder of the European Poker Tour and the current president of Party Poker Live. He's also a TV director and plays a little bit of poker in his spare time. He has amassed $2.9 million in live career tournament earnings, plus many millions more in various cash games around the world, I'm sure. Welcome to the podcast, John Duffy. Yeah, I'm not sure that's accurate. I'm thinking I've probably done millions in cash <laughs> games around the world. But, um, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, how's lockdown treating you, John? It's good. I mean, I feel like... a. I, I feel like it's a very natural state of affairs for me. I normally spend my time isolated here in the countryside. Um, so really, I think what I am starting just now, starting to miss seeing other people. Do you know what I mean? Just having even complete strangers. I just like, I like to sometimes just, you know, just bump into complete strangers. And I'm kind of missing that interaction now. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a long, it's been too long. For me, I think I've probably been, I've probably been locked down for oh, 10 weeks now, probably. Mm, yeah, it's good, definitely getting to that point. I think, uh, yeah, starting people, uh, people are starting to miss those, uh, those interactions. I definitely find just going to the shops and those kind of small things, you appreciate the, the small interactions with people uh, a lot more now. For sure, yeah. And the, how valuable they are too. Um, and I think... Uh, I, 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 for the first time I went to a garden centre yesterday, that's the first time I've really been out. I've, everything have been getting delivered, all groceries have been getting mm -hmm. delivered, everything. So yesterday was the first time I went out and it was quite, it was quite weird. The, uh, all the social dis, it was very much post, you know, sort of dystopian future, post apocalypse sort of shit going on. And I, I found it quite weird, really. Um, but and that was just in a garden centre. Never mind. <laughs> Who knows what it must be like in somewhere like Vegas? Yeah, yeah. I've seen, yeah, I've seen, so seen some photos and videos of the the ghost town that is Vegas. So it's definitely yeah. yeah Tumble, strange, strange world. Mm. Very strange. Yeah. Um, so John, uh, can you tell me a bit about your your background and your first introduction to gambling? My background. Well, I came, my parent, I was born in Leeds in uh, 1958 in Yorkshire and uh, to a very, sort of middle class family. My parents were both doctors. My mother was a, they were both, they had a joint practice together. My mother had been a, a surgeon and then she went into joint practice with my father and I was brought up there. I went to the local grammar school. Uh, the first time I ever set foot in a betting shop was probably when I was about 16 and I went to put a bet on a horse and like every kid who puts their first bet on it, I, I managed to pick like a 14 to one winner. Um, <laughs> and so spent a lot of time betting on horses and losing all my money. Yeah. And then the first time I went to a casino was on my 18th birthday. I went to a, a casino in Moortown in Leeds, uh, and mainly played roulette. You know, I just I used to play a lot of roulette, mm. some blackjack, but mainly mainly roulette. I really like roulette. Um, so I, I did a quite a fair bit. You know, you did a fair bit of casino games in Leeds, mm. uh, cent, either the cent Leeds Central casinos or the Moortown casino, um, and. Really, then I moved to London when I was about 19. I was 
spent like a year and a half in Australia actually, so it's probably 19 and a half, and uh, moved to London and that was really very, didn't really go back to, uh, my dad, my dad died when I was about six, when I was 16, because uh, he was quite ill, he had sort of, he was alcoholic, he had issues with alcoholism. Okay. Um, and my mother died not long after that because she had similar issues. I think this was one of the big problems with doctors is that you have ready access to drugs and mm. uh, they had big issues with that. They were lovely, wonderful people, but <clears throat> they had problems. And uh, so they died very young. So I moved to London when I was about 20, yeah, 19, 19 and a half, 20, I suppose. Uh, and really... Uh, I did about a year down there, then I came back home and then I went to university for a year, Got didn't do any work, so got kicked out of university. <laughs> um, uh, then, then I went back down to London and started work, you know, trying to find work. I got various jobs in London. Was it TV work and that kind of stuff at this time or just very... No, not to begin with no it was like like it was like i was a, a waiter for a while you know i got a job as a waiter which is actually where i met my wife uh but i was my first job was holding a spotlight on uh strippers at a club <laughs> in soho in london that was my very first job i used to hold the follow spot on the strippers and um at night that club used to turn into well actually at the weekends it used to turn into the comedy store and it was when Alexi Sale and Rick Mail uh, were, well, he, Alexi Sale was compare and Rick Mail uh, was there with um, Aid Edmondson. I think they were called 20th Century Coyote. <clears throat> and um, Keith Allen, there were all these sort of comedians there. Mm. Uh, that, that was amazing. Robin, Robin Williams did a, 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 a stand up there one night, improv, uh, Bill Hicks. You know, it was an amazing club and it also had, the other, it was during, during that, that period in like 1980s at um there used to be like theme clubs in london so every so a club like that uh even though it was a strip club during the day it would it would be uh on tuesday nights it was a club called the soul furnace which was all soul music then on wednesday night it was called the lift which was a, a gay club and then on thursday it was like the rap club which was like the first rap club in in london so it was a brilliant it was a as a, because I worked there, I just got this wonderful insight into all these different sort of subcultures that were going on in London. Uh, so I loved, I loved working there. I worked there for about maybe a year and a bit, you know, uh, and that was a, that was a great job. Uh, and, and and combined it with uh, waiting, I had about three jobs because I was having to pay off a, a big credit card debt that I'd run up gambling probably, <laughs> and uh, so I had three jobs at the same time and. Uh, I used to try to just grab sleep um, between each job. Um, so three three jobs every day. It was, it was I was working all hours. Mm. Um, so that was, yeah. Uh, when when did poker first kind of uh, enter the fray for you in London? Not really. I mean, really quite late. I I stopped drinking when I was twenty seven, and. It was so. This is you know. By then, I'd done a few jobs, and you know. Um, but but then I stopped drinking, and I kind of needed something to fill the void, <clears throat> and I didn't want it to be casino gambling because I knew that I was going to really go completely broke if I did that. So there was one. There was one evening, I was at the Victoria Casino. I didn't go to the Vic that much. I used to go to a different casino, but I went to the Vic one night, and I saw these guys sitting there. These, these really in, interesting looking guys sitting there playing what turned out to be seven card, pot limit seven card stud. And I kind of went over and I started, I was watching the game for a while. And then one of the guys was started to be really friendly. And he was actually a guy who some people from the VIT will, will know still. He's called, he was called Freddie Carl. And uh, Freddie was playing right up until about a year ago. And then I think he retired um but uh had a formidable player so he was really friendly because he he was the kind of one that kept the game going and he could yeah. see i was like in my suit i was I, I had a job as a i'd got this dreadful job as like a surveyor management surveyor which i hated but i got a reasonably good salary and um but i was drinking far too much uh but 
that, but then I then I quit drinking. And so anyway, I started. I saw these guys, and I wrote off to the the gamblers bookshop in Las Vegas and and asked them to send me all their books, all the books they had on seven, you know, seven card studs. So they they sent me these Sklansky, Malmoth and Z, I think it was, or and, yeah. and then David Sklansky's Theory of Poker. And so I really read those voraciously for about a week. And uh, and then that was it. That was it. That was me hooked. I was there because I was I wasn't answering to anybody at this time. I'm, you know, because because my parents, because I was my parents were dead. I was, you know, I had a sister, but really she was getting on with her own, you know, her own life. And uh, so I I had nobody really to answer to. So I could do what I wanted. I just literally used to live in the casino. And I was what, and I went there every night. I lost my salary for you know every. Every week I lost my salary playing poker. Um, and it took me a year and a half really till I got a significant, you know, win maybe in a tournament uh, at the Vic. Or it might not have been at the Vic, it might have been at Russell Square, a casino, another casino in London. And then, uh, then I got really hooked. Uh, and it was really, uh, I just loved the game. And I never, I still love it now, you know. Yeah. Um, much prefer live though. Yeah, um, yeah. Your 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 approach, kind of, to poker and gambling, kind of early days. Um, what what do you think drew uh, drew you to it initially? Was it was it the buzz? Was it the gamble? Was it the the fact you said you ordered the the book straight away? It was obviously a strategic element. Um, is it, or was it a combination of everything that attracted you to to poker and gambling? I think it was a combination of a lot. I think it was, I think it was it was a it was an attempt to try to stay in a casino without playing casino games, because I knew I was just going to go broke on casino games, as everybody does. And I kept, you know, I was losing lots of money on, on, uh, on roulette and blackjack, yeah. even though I had a system. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that was the reason. And also, the other thing that attracted me, I think, was just the, the characters mm. that were in the game. I just found everybody, and still do, found everybody fascinating there weren't near there were no young kids in these days you know there was no there was no guys your you know your age you know there was it was always people in their 40s and you know yeah there, literally nobody under the age of 40 i wouldn't say yeah, apart from me maybe there were one or two people uh 28 29 but no kids no no real young young kids and so it was fascinating because there was a mixture of like like ga criminals, gangsters, writers, uh, you know, all, all sorts of different, a real strange, classless under, underworld of, of uh, subculture, in, in, which I just found amazing. And I, I loved every single one of them. And Simon Trumple was hanging around, you know, sometimes during the tournaments. He'd come around. If ever there was a tournament at the Vic, suddenly, they, suddenly Trumple would appear and I'd, I'd see him and he was, he was a bit... And still is a character, you know. There's so many interesting people around at that time. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Clear. It's clear from what you're saying that it was definitely the the kind of the environment uh, you were drawn to. Uh, I think, as I said, the poker the poker world is definitely it's such a such a unique uh, world, and uh, the. Just is, the, soci yeah. the sociology of the subculture, I think, in the gambling world is like is like nothing else that you see. Um, it is, and it's very, very, it's very attractive. Yeah. Um, for someone like yourself who you know went on to do creative things, some TV directing and stuff, did you can't, as I said, you can't help but see a lot of these guys as uh, as characters. And uh, when did uh, did those two worlds ever kind of meld in your head? Uh, the the kind of the TV world and these characters that you're gambling with uh, regularly. Sometimes I did a, I did um, I did an episode of Kavanaugh QC later. I can't remember what year it was. It was probably about. Actually, it's probably in the late nineties, like ninety eight, ninety nine, or something like that. And I was a, uh, I wasn't directing. I was the first assistant director at that time. Uh, and I decided that it would be a very good idea to fill the jury <laughs> with extras uh, of all poker, of all these dodgy fucking poker players. Yeah. <laughs> so the whole of the, the whole of the jury of one episode of Kavanaugh QC is filled. Looks, it's, it's really funny because it's got like, um, 
uh, all this, these characters uh, from the Vic. Uh, I think there were about five or six of them in the jury, and they looked they looked dodgier than anybody in the dock. It was it wasn't very good. It wasn't very good casting from <laughs> my <point of> view. <laughs> But that was that was one crossover period. Um, the only other time, no, they never really crossed over. I, you know, there were a number of occasions, like when I went to the Isle of Man, where I had to, I was editing a, a series called As If, and um, I had to lie to the producers to tell them, you know, to go over to to the Isle of Man to play in this tournament. I said I was going on holiday with my wife. <laughs> Which was a really stupid thing to do because it was it ended up it was live on Sky, but I didn't think anybody would be watching it, and and then even if they were watching it, they weren't going to see me because, you know, I was uh you know I wasn't going to get to the final table probably, but of course I ended up winning the bloody thing. Is that probably a reasonable calculated risk at the time? Uh, that's you know if if you do end up winning it, it's uh, it's win win anyway. I think it was it was worth it, and they they it turned out that they did they they did what the producer watched it, and we had a bit of a laugh about it because <laughs> I had to actually go back to work the, the, i flew i won it on the Sunday i think or Saturday or Sunday, and had to fly back to London on the Monday, and then I was back at work on the Monday because I was editing this uh, show, so I had to go into the the studio and edit edit uh, stuff there. It was very funny yeah right off the back of us um yeah, was there ever any temptation to make any kind of movie or a documentary about kind of poker players? Or obviously, you ended up going into the EPT side of things, but um, kind of. Uh, it was, was actually there, there, there used to be a place. I, I, I quite like the. I, I was one one time I wanted to do entourage type TV series, yeah, based around Panorama Heights in Vegas. I don't know if you've heard of. Panorama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's where all the poker players stay. And I really like the idea of doing a sort of uh, TV series loosely based around probably Antonio Sandiari's life in Panorama Heights and um, all his friends and his, you know, there'd be people like Brian Rast and Phil Lack. And I think, you know, it wouldn't be about them, but it would be the, the fictional characters would be very loosely based on them. And I think it would be, I still think it would actually make a really interesting TV series, as long as you didn't go too much into the game itself, because yeah. I think that um, the game, it's, if you, you can't really, you can never really show a hand of poker in a drama like that. You have to, you have, you have to really just go into the impact that losses and wins have on an individual psyche. Uh, their relationships with their, you know, significant others, uh, who they're sharing their life with, how, whether, you know, what they're doing, you know, what they're doing to, to give themselves an edge in the game or what, whatever, you know, whatever they're getting up to, whether it's good or bad or funny or sad, that wouldn't be the drama of it all. So, so very little, <clears throat> you know, there's no point doing like a karate kid type, uh, yeah, drama of somebody going to win the World Series because I think that's pretty boring. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's, different. it's a different kind of story. <clears throat> yeah, it yeah. is. But an entourage thing, I think, would work very, very well. Yeah, still, uh, still would I think? Um, yeah, yeah, by all means. Um, yeah, <laughs> it definitely. Uh, you've sold me on it anyway. It uh, definitely mm. sounds like uh, an attractive, uh, an attractive kind of project. Uh, yeah, as I said, I think. Uh, all the things that's around poker players and the lifestyles and just uh, you know, the, the people find that the you know, emotional roller coaster is very dramatic. Yeah, you know, reality TV is all about you know these emotional roller coasters, and uh, I think a lot of poker players and gamblers just live that life as a byproduct of what they do. So uh, definitely quite yeah. an, an attractive thing to most people, I think. Well, it is, I think, and I think that people find it quite fascinating. You know, they um, the con the concept of somebody winning. A million dollars, you know, and uh, not really, and not really, and they're not really thinking that much about it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? They're going, yeah, all right, I've won a million. You know, so they, you know, nobody really. It used to be huge, okay, ten years ago, but now it's like nothing. So I think people would be quite fascinated by this, and pro I'm probably quite disgusted by it as well because I think it's pretty, it's pretty hideous. Uh, that you know, sometimes the amount of money that is involved uh, and gambled and won and lost and and, you know, if you are, a, I don't know, if you're a single mother desperately trying to bring up your, you know, two kids on their own, on your own in, you know, in Dublin or, you know, or wherever, in Leeds or Dublin or Manchester, yeah. 
you know, and you sort of turn on the telly and you see some reality show about some poker players. I think you'd be, I think you'd be really angry with them because, you know, every hundred, every every pound, it's 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 huge to you, you know. And I think if you've been skint in your life, which I have three times, you know, you learn to uh, really, uh, you learn to appreciate money a lot more um, by when you've actually literally not, ha- I've not, you know, literally had no money, not had enough money to buy a packet of cigarettes, you know. Yeah. Um, which for me is the ultimate, <laughs> not <laughs> really having enough money um, to get food. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I, I think it's uh, you know poker poker players understand that that's um, you know not if the money means too much to you, then it's impossible to play poker efficiently or gamble efficiently. So it is that uh, that balance. It's understandable when you're in the kind of world why they they show um, that attitude to money, but obviously, yeah, to, to other people it does. But I think uh, the other the other side of it though as well is that I think it's good to show the positive things that people do like, um, you know, like uh, Igor and Liv and Philip Roussant, you know, they've just got this, you know, the wonderful charity that they have. The, everybody, you know, Dust Till Dawn, like Alex yeah. Potwell or Rob, you know, Rob's uh, wife, you know, does an enormous amount of uh, good work for, ch- you know, for, char- for charity, you know, or just, just literally getting hands on and going and feeding people, you know, doing food, you know, food runs for people. I mean, really incredible, um, you know, Rob's incredibly generous. You know, he's given, he gives huge amounts of money to charity, as does, you know, Dan Smith. You know, there's a huge number of people, Bill Perkins, who give massive amounts of money to, um, to charity. Um, a lot of poker players, and I think that should be highlighted as well. Yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. Because uh, otherwise, otherwise people people never know about that side of um, how generous some poker players can be. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's it's one thing poker players. Um, as I said, I think it is partly because of that attitude to money. But uh, Joe I've said it, said on this podcast before. I spoke to Boric Parkinson about all the kind of charity mm. work he's done. Boric's very charity. You know, he's a yeah. very uh, altruistic uh, mm. and. Very it, yeah, just uh, the the generosity of poker players is, um, I think, is a very good thing in the community, and uh, it's definitely something that you know we should be proud of. And there's two sides to everything, and uh, definitely, I, uh, I think the, the the generosity is a big, big thing in poker. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just want to want to talk about the EBT in a moment, John. But the uh, the poker million, um, just want to talk about your performance in the poker million. So. For those that aren't aware, the uh, the Poker Million took place in the year 2000, uh, so really early doors poker. Uh, it was the Poker Million, so the whole selling point was a £1 million first prize. It was a £6,000 buy-in and it had 156 runners. Uh, so anyone quick at maths might realise that doesn't quite uh, add up to £1 million. So they ended up going with the £1 million first prize. Uh, do you remember what was uh, for 10th in that tournament? For 10th? Yeah. I don't think you did. You get anything for tenth? You I got you, only, you got I two thousand pounds for tenth. Two thousand was it? All oh, right, that is, <laughs> so sick. that is really sick. I think uh, for six for six you got. It was really bad. I think it was third, second, and first. It was it was fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, and a million. Yeah, for third, second, and first. Yeah, um, ridiculous. I'll uh, yeah I'll post the full the full payouts uh, on the screen yeah. in the edit here but uh, yeah I, I believe it was uh, I think a hundred thousand for second but um, coming in kind of tenth ninth eighth uh, when you're getting kind of a few thousand pounds with a million up top it's it's drama like that um, and no deals either you yeah couldn't, I, literally couldn't do a deal and what was the uh, what was the backing situation and the swapping percentages situation like in the year two thousand well, no I didn't I don't know I never. It didn't happen. I mean, me personally, the only reason I entered that tournament is because I'd won a... No, no, I came third in a tournament at the Vic the previous week. Yeah. And I'd won about 17,000, I think. And uh, so I decided to use six of six and a bit of it to enter the Poker Million. It was, it was like a dream, really. And I had... I, I, I don't know whether other people were swapping pieces of each other. I, I, I'm I, sure. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, 
all I know I is they I were. Know. I didn't know anything about it back then. I didn't know anything about swaps. I knew about savers. You know, I knew that you could do savers with people, but I had, you know, no savers. But the thing is, they had when you when you got down to the final table, you had uh, Barry Hearn had a meeting with all six of us, and he assigned a security guard, six security guards, to each player. And this player, and then he gave this speech. I remember he was really, I really like Barry, he's a great guy. And he gave this speech, and he literally said, You know, if any of you do a deal, if any of you, if I catch any of you doing a deal, I'm gonna do, you know, you'll, you'll be immediately disqualified, right? And all, all you know, so you're gonna get literally these security guards are gonna follow you around everywhere, even when you went for a piss, they used to come in and follow you in there. To, uh, mm. And um, he it, that was the situation, and so it was really uh it was really really tough yeah it's, it's, it turned out quite well actually <laughs> it did yeah um i said just such such a unique uh kind of thing just from the point of view of as i said no deals the you know all this kind and of live live on live sports. yeah li live on yeah. Scottish sports um did you watch it were you you're too young probably um i i was a little bit too young for that um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I i will i will tell you my my first kind of uh TV viewing experiences with the EPT when I was uh, a teenager okay. in secondary school on Challenge uh, on on TV, but um, yeah, 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 I yeah, yeah the, the the Poker Billion, um, Jesse May uh, described it. He um, so it was he said it was it was the highlight of his uh, poker commentary career, as he said, live properly live on Sky Sports, oh, yeah. and um, he, he described uh, yeah, he, he, great energy to it. He described uh, John Duffy as. Um, he comes into the final table. Uh, everything about him was totally straightforward and tight. That was how he presented himself. That was how he played the whole tournament up to that point. Then on the final table, things completely changed. Um, was that uh, was that your greatest ever acting performance, John? Was this all a conscious effort? You know, I'm going to tell you that what I, what actually happened. I'm going to come clean about what happened. Okay, it was um, yeah. I played. I was. Look, I played really, really tight all the whole tournament. And also, I was a very tight player. I was very unimaginative. I mm. didn't really have, you know, I did occasionally I would bluff, but I didn't, uh, I wasn't that aggressive. I was very tight. And so, uh, if, you know, if somebody bet the flop and I'd missed, I'd just fold. You know, there was no, there was no floating or anything like that. So, um, but what happened, what happened was really interesting um, because we, after, after a while, we, we hadn't, uh, um after a while we hadn't seen a flop that's right i remember that whenever anybody raised uh the um the, there would be a you know everybody folded and i thought my god this must be really boring television okay so anyway as a director yeah. i remember i was sitting first of all as a, as a director i felt very sorry just let me just turn that off a second my wife she's out um, as a director, I suddenly thought this must be really boring, and I felt really comfortable in TV studio. I had no problem uh, with the, the cameras, the lights. I, I was, I felt really at home. Okay, everybody else, I think, were really intimidated by the cameras, the lights, the commentary yeah. because Jesse, they haven't really done it before. You know? Yeah, J Jesse mentioned that's these pros. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so I just was sitting there really relaxed. But then in my head, I said, "This is, must be really boring." Right, the next pre-flop raise, I'm going to call whatever sort of marginal hand we've got. Okay, mm. and so anyway, uh, Tony Bloom raised, and I had like I had Jack Queen off suit, so I thought, okay, I'll call, and it came like Ace three nine or something like that. I can't remember the exact flop. Ace three nine. I checked, and Tony Bloom bet like half the pot. I didn't have really that much left. I didn't, no, no, I didn't know anything about fold equity, but luckily I obviously now, if I looked at that hand, I'd, I'd, I'd realized I had obviously had enough chips to get him to fold. But he's meant to, obviously he's meant to have an ace in this situation, <laughs> but luckily for me, he didn't. Okay, so anyway, I'd moved, I just moved all in on an ace, you know, Ace nine three board, and I had Jack Queen. There was no suit. It was just ridiculous. It was, it was crazy. It was suicide. But anyway, it worked. So I, once that worked, I thought actually that's probably really good telly. 
<laughs> right, I'm going to do that a few more times. I'm going to do that a few more times. Now, once I started doing that, it was like as if, it was almost as if I was directing the show itself by playing in it, right? So I was trying to make it more of a drama by being, you know, much more dramatic. And I took my time. I took a really long time and about decisions. I was, and then suddenly I, I, and then suddenly when I took a long time, I just suddenly picked up off. I started to pick up. To, feelings of people right i really felt actually if i move if i rear back race here he, mm. this guy's gonna fall you know whoever who ian dobson or whoever it was if i if i just come over the top if i come over the top they're gonna fold and sure enough they did so i just waited and because of the cameras uh because of the literally because of the cameras the cameras never lie right so what was happening is the, what it normally in a normal situation somebody like ian dobson would look as cool as a cucumber, right? If he was, you know, if he was bluffing. But if you waited long enough, because yeah. they were all on television, because they'd never been on telly or in front of the camera, they suddenly started to reveal themselves, okay? Mm -hmm. It was a huge advantage. I had a massive edge in this game, absolutely massive. They were sweating their pupils, their blood, everything was going on them. And I just knew, I just knew that they were they were they were lying they were just lying you know and it, the camera was telling me that they were lying so that was really one and of course th then i got lucky in one key crucial hand and um, then won it uh, so it was amazing it was a great it was a, it, for me it was life obviously life changing you know mm, uh yeah so yeah you're saying it's uh you're thinking about it as a director at the table um what are you thinking as a poker player, Jordan, on that? Does the pressure get you at any point? You know, I, I had this, you know, when I, when I flew over, it was a very strange feeling, actually, when I decided to go to enter, because there's no way I was ever going to enter that tournament. It was mm. far too much money. I was, I was entering that tournaments, which were maximum like 200 quid, you know, maximum. I couldn't afford it. Right. So, to spend 6k as a buy but the only reason i did it was because i knew i was going to win it i just had this feeling the week you know the week after i won that um after i'd come third in that tournament i just had this feeling that i just was going through a process and that i had to go there and i was meant to be at home with my wife we were meant i was meant to stay at home we had friends coming that weekend um, she said, look, you can't go. We've got friends coming. And I said, look, I have to go because I'm going to win it. And she said, don't be stupid. You're not, you're not going to win it. You know? And anyway, she said, yeah, I don't want you to go. You've got friends coming. You've already made this arrangement. I said, I have to go. And luckily we were out for dinner with a friend of ours and she, she's a really, she's quite uh, persuasive. And she said to Charlotte, she, she's a very good friend of Charlotte, my wife. And she said, you've got to let him go if he's going to do it. And so she said, oh, all right, go. So I went. But I knew that I was going to win. I just was going through this process. It was absolutely bizarre. Um, I've never known, I've never been so certain of anything in my life that I was going through a process and that I was going to win that particular tournament. And I've, ne it's never, I've never really had that uh, before and I've never, have it, I've never had it since. There are, there are certain times where I know I'm going to, when I sit down in a cash game, I know I'm going to lose. <laughs> and there, are other, you know, there, are, there are other times where I, I enter a tournament and I feel very bullish and I, sometimes I'll go a really long way. Uh, the on, actually, funny enough, the online tournament, the, the millions of the tournaments uh, last year, which I did well in, uh, I knew I was going to do well in that. And it didn't worry, I didn't think I was going to win it, but I knew I was going to do well. And I came like fifth, I think. Yeah, mm. with fifth, yeah, I came like fifth, but it was a huge payout for fifth, you know, and I was really happy with it, you know, becoming, you know, fifth or fourth, whatever it was. But um, anyway, that was a that was a, a weird, a weird moment in in my life. Mm. Um, yeah. So following that, um, what's yeah, what's your life kind of following that? The, the EPT comes along a few years later. Um, what do, do you see yourself as a poker player? What do you kind of what's what's I've life like had, for John Duffy at this point? Well, obviously after after the Poker Million win, I, it I became it was a you know it was a very significant win. Yeah. Uh, but online poker wasn't really around yet. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there was there were, you know poker stars didn't exist in in two thousand. 
you know, they came along in 2001. Uh, Ultimate Bet existed and they, 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 you know, they just had just started. So, you know, people like that dog, Russ Hamilton, uh, was there trying to get, you know, give, get deals for people and they were paying you 5,000 to wear their shirt at the final table. So things were just starting to happen with online poker. But really, up until then, it had only been Planet Poker. I think, obviously, Lab Books had a site, otherwise they wouldn't have sponsored it. But um, micro gaming maybe had started. But it, wasn't re- it hadn't really taken off yet. It, hadn't really, it wasn't really until Poker Stars came in 2001 that it really took off. But I never really saw myself as... A po- I still didn't see myself as a per- poker player. I was still very much a director, and I still carried on directing mm-hmm. and enjoyed directing and... Uh, and, car- and, and and continue to direct all, pretty much all my all my poker uh, career, apart from really when I set the EPT up because it was just too I was too busy and also doing too well. You know, I was a, the EPT was making me enough money to uh, to be comfortable and also there was an element of creativity there too. Mm. Um, so really, that happened in uh, two thousand and four. But it, look, it was no it was no. I, I just copied. It's not, it's not, I copied the WPT and changed the letter. Okay? <laughs> That's all I did. I'm no. I'm no visionary. It was. It, I just. I realised that that you know. I looked at the World Poker Tour, and I said, well, "Hold on a minute. They, they call it the World Poker Tour, but they've actually only got one yeah. stop outside America, yeah. and that was in Paris. Okay, at the aviation." And that was because Bruno, that was really the only reason that that happened was because Bruno Fatuzzi knew Mike Sexton really well. And Bruno ran the aviation club. Yeah. So that's how, that's why it happened there. The idea of holding a tournament in the aviation club was just absurd. I don't know if you've ever been there. Have you been there? I am. Um, no, I probably, passed by it. Probably not. By it in the yeah, but, day, but they, uh, they didn't let me in there, uh, believe it. <laughs> but, but it's, the thing is, it's just too small to mm. have a major poker tournament in. You, could, you just couldn't do it. Amazing, wonderful club. And, you know, and actually it's just re, 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 recently reopened. Uh, I heard that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, um, uh, but the, uh, but anyway, so anyway, I looked at, I watched, I was, watched the WPT, the first season of it on the Travel Channel, and I thought, well, this is silly. I could, I could do this in, in Europe. I know all the casinos because I've traveled around all the casinos. I know the casinos. I've got good contacts in television um, and I've got a few quid in the bank because of the poker million. So why don't I do, you know, why don't I do that? Why don't I set up this, the European poker tour, EPT? So anyway, I ran, you know, went around, I started at the Vic. They, they in principle agreed, you know, yeah. Uh, they were, you know, I think the first season they were, they were willing to spend like 12 and a half thousand pounds, you know, which is, Believe me, absolutely nothing, you know, uh, to be part of it. I'm not, I'm not even sure. Actually, they may have even paid nothing for it in the first year. Um, but anyway, they agreed to, they agreed to do it. Yeah. Um, I managed to, then I went to various other casinos around Europe. Uh, and then I did a deal with Monte Carlo because I really wanted to do it the final in Monte Carlo. So anyway, the first season worked, you know, it really worked. And then... Obviously, I managed, I got PokerStar. Originally, I didn't want I didn't want uh, there to be an over overriding sponsor. I thought I didn't like that idea. I wanted each event to be sponsored by a different brand. I thought it was more egalitarian. I, I thought it, it meant that nobody really had full control and nobody, uh, you know, nobody would be too powerful. So I was dealing with all of the online sites like Loudbrook. You know. Was it was it was your long term aim for you know this to be your kind of job? This, this was your thing, the EPT was yours, and then you worked with various casinos and various online operators, or what was your kind of long-term thinking with it? No, no, my long, I'll tell you, the long-term, the, the long-term prospect was this. I had three companies. I set up three companies. Uh, I set up the European Poker Tour. I set up a production company to film yeah. all the events. It's a separate company. And I set up an online uh an online poker company called what was it called uh you know i've forgotten what it was called isn't that weird but anyway i set up a company uh which was going to develop an online poker site 
which would feed into all the live events. Okay, and I managed to raise for the online poker site. I managed to raise about two million quid um, to to get that into development. And I had meetings with loads of software deck people to, yeah. to to develop it and get it get it up and running. Uh, Production company is no problem because I already knew about that. And the EPT itself was just negotiating contracts between the casinos and uh, 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 the European Poker Tour, um, and also then doing all the TV deals through the uh, broadcasting company. So it was all fairly straightforward. And then I thought, and then um, what happened then? Um, I kind of fucked up really because I wasn't really a very good businessman. And so I, what happened was I. Uh, Barcelona was about to happen in September. Um, I'd managed to raise this two million quid to develop the software, but a lot of the money had come from like people I knew, uh, like business associates mm. or friends who'd invested. You know, they could afford it. You know, they, they could afford to lose it if it all went belly up, but it wasn't going to go belly up. But I got cold feet on the software side of things. I thought that. that Poker stars and all these other companies were far, they were so far ahead, it was going to be really difficult to compete with them. And at this point, I'd been negotiating with pretty much everybody else apart from poker stars. So Ladbrokes were going to have a cruise, uh, Prima Poker were going to have one event. Uh, there was another, I'm trying to think of all the various sites that were, there were about four or five or six different sites that were going to have an event on the yeah. first European poker tour. And then suddenly, Isai Scheinberg rang me. I know that's right. There was a company called there was a guy called Tristan Niebuhr who was setting up a, a channel called the Poker Channel on, mm -hmm. um, on Sky. It was going to be a, 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 a you know a channel on Sky called the Poker Channel, and he'd been doing uh, negotiating with poker stars for them to get uh, to back it somehow or to put money into it. And um, anyway, they wanted uh, he and Isai wanted to have the EPT on the Poker Channel. And they'd invested into the poker channel, and uh, so we had like a three-way chat about about this, and then the conversation ended. And then Chris, this guy Crispin, yes, I said, can I can I talk to you privately, John? After Crispin's gone, I went, yeah, sure. So we, and then we had a chat, and he and we we were talking, and we spoke about, and we just discussed, and he said, look, they really wanted to sponsor, you know, the EPT. Yeah, they'd heard they'd heard very good things about it. They heard that I was well, I was very far down the line. I'd negotiate. You know, they'd heard that it was going to happen, mm. they, and they wanted to be part of it. Uh, in the back of my mind, I'd kind of always wanted them to be part of it, but I didn't really want them to be the overriding sponsor. However, because they were, because they were, they because by then they really were all about tournaments, and they were huge. They were massive tournament sites in two thousand and four. They were just starting to get really big. Mm. There, there was a massive European market, but obviously in the states and the Canada they, they were huge. So I um, eventually we did a deal, and I, I actually had to bin off everybody else, and I let Poker Stars take over the whole of the thing. So it was going to be much much easier, and also they they the amount the money that they were prepared to spend on the production meant that we were going to get much better. It was going to be, it was all going to be a lot easier, you know, yeah. with the broadcasters, you know, it was, there were lots of deals you could do. They, they, they were, they were buying advertising around the shows and things like that. It was much, it was much more, um, it, it was a much better package. And also yeah. dealing, I, I decided that dealing with one person was actually a lot easier. And I really liked this guy as well. I really liked him as a person. So, uh, you know, and he was, he was a guy, he was a green light guy. He just, Whatever he said yeah. went, so it didn't. It was very easy to deal with him, and and Mark as well, and um, and so that was it. And that so that was that was that was really how it happened. And so we, but the problem, you know, the problem was I made some I made some pretty silly commercial errors. I I gave it to them much too cheaply. I gave them options right very early on to buy it, and so I didn't make a huge amount of money out of the EPT. I should have made a lot more. Um, you know, people. A lot of people think I made absolutely shitloads of money out of it, but but I just didn't. You know, you know, people like Porrick know the truth. But uh, the uh, but I enjoyed it though. I really enjoyed setting it up. I loved. You know, all the European players were behind me because they knew me. Uh, so everybody came to all the events, and they were really good fun. And uh, they were very small to begin with, but really funny. Um, mm. and, you know, like the the first tournament in the Marion in in. Uh, in the 
in Dublin was was amazing. And then I had made the big mistake when we were at the RDA of having a a, a free bar, <laughs> uh, uh, at, and that was a big 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 mistake to have a free bar in the, in Dublin because they were <laughs> people were literally coming in off the street who had no no word got round the word got round and suddenly. It was there were people fighting on the bleachers, you know. There were people asleep on the on the seats yeah. while, during the final table. It was so it was so funny, but I I loved every minute of it. It was really really good fun. Yeah, um, it was. And it went on to be a great success, and still is, you know. Exactly, I was going to say, looking back, just as uh, you know, it was your brainchild at the end of the day. Surely, there's a lot of pride, as you know, money aside, but uh, just as a project. Uh, does it say yeah, it, yeah it I'm very proud of having set it up and uh, yeah. uh, it's you know I couldn't have done it without poker stars for sure look there's no there's no doubt about it they they made a huge they sent so many they, they ran so many satellites and and pushed so many people in and they had so much you know it was they were they were it was huge the impact of them but then but then again they they couldn't have done it without me you know they they wouldn't it probably it would definitely wouldn't have happened without somebody like me you have to have that have yeah. to have those contacts you know but i was selling to europe you know so their german market for instance was was literally uh, i did a deal with eurosport i sold the whole show the whole of the ept to eurosport for 1 euro okay i sold the whole show to eurosport for 1 euro but i knew that the impact on the German, because the Ger German, German, uh, Germany watch all their sport on Eurosport, right? Eurosport is a huge channel in Germany. You know, you just have to ask any German, uh, they'll tell you that, and certainly back then it was massive. And so millions of people used to watch the European Poker Tour on Eurosport in Germany. As a result of that, the, the German market for the poker stars German market exploded it became absolutely huge in Germany uh, poker um, and they you know they made a killing out of that just for, just because you know I sold it to them for a euro you know it was it was that was that was uh, you know that was the impact of that so it did it did I was very proud of, of some of the some of the deals I've made with the you know channel you know challenge you mentioned earlier on mm. channel four um all of those channel five as well mm. yeah i believe yeah i think it was on uh I, I think it was on challenge when i uh as i said when i was kind of yeah. watching it as a, as a teenager yourself and colin murray were uh were commentating yeah, on right. that season. <laughs> good old colin yeah yeah um he went, on, he went on to do uh all sorts of good things and of course poor, poor old caroline Clark Clark, as well yeah. who was the uh, uh, an exceptional uh, talent and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful presenter who I really, really, you know, I just had so much uh, admiration. I mean, she was, I, I, I waded through about 50 showreels of presenters and I didn't find any of them really interesting until I saw this one showreel from Caroline. And I remember thinking that she had something really, really special and unique because she'd done some cheeky little interview with john leslie this this guy who'd just been done for some sort of weird something weird i can't remember what it was something i think it was about the sexual abuse or something like that i can't remember but she'd done some interview with him it was really it was really fascinating the way she'd done it and uh so anyway she, she i really I, mean, I was it was absolutely tragic what happened to uh to Karen. i was very, very deeply upset when uh, when when that when i read that news yeah, uh, yeah, but anyway, not to dwell on that. Yeah. And so, yeah, so Colin Murray and Car you know, and Caroline, and we, we we had such fun making those shows. It was great. Mm. Uh, so yeah, during during this period, the EPT is up and running. Uh, you've got a good gig with Poker Stars. Poker is booming. Uh, what's what's your playing career like uh, in these days? Is this what kind of games are you playing? Well, it was. I'm playing lots of games that I probably shouldn't be playing because. Because poker stars were one of the mis the biggest mistake I made was 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 accepting a sponsorship a team pro sponsorship deal. It's I was quite clever because he kind of sussed what sort of person I was. So he offered me a team pro sponsor sponsorship deal, 
uh, which was really big at that time. You know, it was a big. It was, it was like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something like that a year. You know, wow. and yeah. I'm going uh, and and so I had all this. I had this money, and but the stupid thing was that if I had, if I just said, look, I'm not interested in being a team pro, I don't want to do this, but he knew, he knew, he was very clever. He knew that if he said, he offered me that, right, and I became like a team pro. I, okay, there I was, poker stars shirt on, I was, I was, oh, I must be a really good poker player. I'm, you know, sponsored by poker stars, paying me all this shitloads of money to go and play these tournaments all over the world. So I literally, I spunked away all that money, you know, all that money, but the reality is, is I should have been negotiating a proper deal with the European Poker Tour, not thinking about me as a player and just getting that money as a sponsored pro and, and doing that. But it was a look, he, it was clever. It was clever on his good psychology on his part to know that I was a, a degenerate uh, gambler and that the idea of just being able to fly all over the world playing poker as well as, as was, was wonderful, you know, for me. So not only was I flying over to all the EPT events and also stupidly playing cash games. I never won in cash games at a European poker tour. I never played any events at the EPT um, until really the, the Poker Stars Caribbean adventure in like 2010, you know, six years later. So um, it was, a, that was a long time. That was a long time. But that was a, so I did, I did play a lot, but I'm afraid that, that being the play, I should have focused on the business and yeah. stopped, I should have stopped playing poker and I should have just focused on the business. I'd probably, I'd be, I'd be a lot wealthier, but I'm not sure whether I'd be happier. I think what, because I played and because I had so much fun with all this, you know, with that sort of sponsorship money, it made it, it was really, really good fun. You know, I really, really enjoyed it. And I was doing the EPT at the same time. So I, I, I loved it. You know, it was great. It was great. Uh, yeah, but I was, I was never really a very good player. Um, yeah, why, why, why do you think you played um, at that because time? Because I loved it. Yeah, yeah, it was just, was it, again, was it the game? Was it the, the, the gamble? Was it the, the fun with the other players? Um, what, was, it, was there anything in particular that, or, or any style of game? Was it, Joe, was it cash games you liked? Was it tournaments? You know, what was your favourite? I, I, really, I, I really like, I used to love the high stakes cash games in Vegas. And in Monte Carlo as well. I really used to like those. Um, I, but I never, ever, I very, you know, obviously occasionally I'd win, but I, God knows how much money I must have spunked away in those games. I mean, a lot, you know, a lot. And, um, but I really enjoyed them. So there's part of me that I think was a, was a, a, a gambler. I think, you know, I think the addictive personality came out in my, obviously in my table games. But also sometimes it would come out in uh, the game, the live games and the online games themselves. You know, I would very, I could get very sort of, you know, I could be quite addicted to it. But I found what I did find was that it was much easier to control. Um, sorry, it was much easier to control po the poker side uh, of of, uh, of gambling than it was like table games. Table games were a disaster, yeah. you know, uh, and it took me a long. It took me until about three three years ago to stop playing casino table games um and that was having been you know visited vegas on a number of occasions and having credit lines at three different casinos which don't each credit line was uh half a million in each okay. in all these casinos so if i lost half a million in one i would go to another one and could lose so I had some really bad trips there, but I was, they picked me up in a Rolls Royce. They picked me up in a Phantom, a Rolls Royce Phantom from the airport. And they take me and I had a huge, great fuck off suite in the, uh, in the win. And I, and I thought I was the dog's bollocks. Um, but it, eventually it kind of catches up with you. And eventually you kind of, they, and after a few years, they pick you up and you kind of go, you feel like you feel like the jackass he is growing mm. as you get into this stupid car and uh, drive up the strip and everybody welcomes you at the casino and gets you to sign the marker and you go you kind of go oh fucking hell here we go again you know yeah and so luckily on the last my last trip I when I quit 
I had this run where I turned, I, I was playing roulette and I had two, a couple of grand or something, and I turned it into 500,000. I, th I think we're, I think we're okay again. We're okay? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, it seems to be. Uh, I just, uh, I just had you at, uh, you turned a couple of grand into 500,000. Okay, yeah. So anyway, I turned, this is the last time I played roulette. I turned two, yeah, two grand. I was in my swing shorts uh, and I turned two grand into 500,000 at the roulette in the win. And all the security guys were ringing up and it was, it was one of those situations. It was great. And um, by the, and then I thought, well, maybe I can win like a couple of million or something. And so I was pressing and I was, every spin was, I had $40,000 on the table yeah. for every spin. And um, then I had three losing spins and I did, I did have a rule that if I had three, if I was on a roll like that and had three losing spins then I'd quit. So I built it up massively. You, go, you know, this never happens. You know, I know every gambler knows this never happens. Okay. So once I'd had, once I'd done that, I had three losing spins, you know, so I had like 380, whatever it is, 380, yeah, 380,000, something like that. I thought, right, that's it. I'm quit. I'm never going to play this game again. But I never have. I've never, you know, I've never touched a uh, roulette since then. Mm. The only game I'll occasionally play is uh, Ultimate Texas Hold'em with Barney Boatman. But I'll, o I'll only play for like five, five dollars. You know? Yeah. I won't, I won't, I, just for fun, you know. Mm. How do you think you've handled um, addiction uh, throughout your life? Well, I, uh, big, I had big like... question, I know it's... Yeah, no, no, look, I had real problems with it, with, with mm. alcohol and drugs in my 20s. Real, real problems. It's hardly surprising. I had, I had a pretty uh, traumatic um, childhood and, and was very close to addiction all the time. Mm. And so for, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, a, it was no surprise really to me that it, that it would happen. And so in a way, you know, so when I quit at 27, you know, drinking and drugs, Mm. Uh, because I, I was ill, you know, I, I, I went into, you know, went into hosp St. Thomas's Hospital first, and then I went into a treatment centre, and and got off, uh, and went to, you know, went to sort of AA and NA and, 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 uh, for for a while, uh, and uh, and it worked for me, and that was great. So uh, and but you always have to be aware that that's you, that's you for life now. That's it. You know, I, I know and I'm an addict. I know I'm an addict, so I have to be very, very careful. Um, and but I'm very, very lucky because my children have never seen me drunk, or you know, or stoned. I, you know, and I've never had, I've not had one mind-altering uh, drug since you know October the fifth, nineteen eighty-five. I mean, that's a long, that's yeah. a long time. You know, um, so. I've handled it well, and I think um, the the addictive side of gambling. Um, I think I've kind of been I've been lucky because I've have I have I yeah I, we have gone skint a couple of times, and I have done some bad things which I'm not I'm pretty ashamed of. Um, one of which was. After you know, after the poker million, I put a couple of hundred thousand away in a. This is one of the reasons I set up the EPT. Actually, I put uh, a lot of money away in a school fees fund for my children because they were still very young, and I thought it would be useful to pay for their education um, as they grew up. But I, it was meant to be in a joint account with my wife. Um, God bless her, and she one day she looked in the account and there was nothing left, you know, so that I had put 250,000 pounds in there and there was nothing left in it. And she confronted me and said, what the fuck's going on? And I had to come clean. And I said, I'd, I'd lost it all playing, uh, you know, gambling, you know, playing, probably playing high stakes games. Um, and, um, but predominantly gambling too much. So, she said to me, she said, you fucking cunt, you know, and she was, you know, she, she literally fucking freaked out. We're still together. Amazing. But she, she, she said, you're going to fucking pay that back. Right. And so I literally, 
I, I, I was trying, you know, that was why I set the EBT up. To, because the only way I was ever going to be able to earn enough money to pay that back was by yeah. doing something. I was never going to do it by directing TV drama because you only get paid like 50 grand a year, 70 mm. max. Maybe you'd earn 100 one year. But I was never going to do it like that. And, uh, and also we were, you know, we were having real, you know, we, we kind of bought, we bought the house, which is great. Yeah. And I put that money away. But now we were cash broke again. You know, mm. so but we had we had a house, great with no mortgage on it, yeah. but we were cash broke. Yeah, so, uh, so I had to, and so I set that I set the EPT up, and that helped. And that made me, you know, meant that I, I was able to pay that money back eventually. Yeah, uh, over about three years, after about three years, which mm. is great. Yeah, it's um, yeah, I, I can't remember where I read it, but there was um this uh kind of a motivation theory of joe you know, if, if you look at the crack the crack addict on the streets joe you know, a crack addict is whatever fifty thousand dollars a year um addiction if that mm -hmm. guy can you know somehow come up with a thousand dollars every week to feed his addiction um yeah. you know it just shows how powerful that the kind of the motivation is when there you know there, there's something that strong motivating you um oh, so it's nice. yeah yeah it's so yeah, that, that hunger. The hunger is really, really strong, and I think you can, you you will do pretty much anything to feed that hunger, and you can get money from you know, you know most. Let's face it, most of it gets stolen. Uh, I've had many, many things stolen from me by by friends, you know, heroin addict friends over the years, who've you know taken stuff off me. Uh, I mean, I never, I never, I never, I don't think I ever stole anything. No, I didn't. I was never very good at being dishonest, yeah. um, but but I did have a lot of friends who nicked off who nicked off me, but but you know look some of them are dead and some of them are clean now, um, and I still see some of the guys who are clean who got clean usually back probably around the same time I did, a lot of the girls and guys, I still see these that now that now um, I can think of six or seven of them who I still see and we still keep in touch and we're still really good friends. And all of them are clean now, and some of them were really heavy heroin addicts. The real, there was a real spate of um, um, heroin addiction during the 1980s. Heavy, heavy heroin addiction. Um, a lot of friends of mine died. In fact, I'd say, in fact, I had a shared. A, I went into halfway houses. Six, six guys, and four of them within, and um, four of them died within a year of coming out of uh treatment or you know and they were just straight back onto smack and yeah we were dead uh, within a year so you see you know you have to be it's a fucking it's a it's a vicious vicious uh drug um heroin mm. Very yeah and, but addiction of all natures is, is heavy uh it is yeah yeah and i think um but you learn a lot about yourself over the years yeah um i think so um and i think there's you know different 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 types of addiction as well within the gambling world i think you see you know that there's so many different types and it can manifest itself in so many different ways um and you just touched on kind of job people sometimes people steal to feed their addiction and all that um do you how do you how do you feel about when you kind of get burnt from people suffering from addiction uh do you hold them personally responsible um, do you blame the disease? What's what's your kind of feeling on that? I don't. I don't blame anybody really. I think um, you know. Look, I, I'm like every. I don't. I I don't like. I don't like say like poker players who borrow money and don't pay it back. Yeah. Mm. I don't. Yeah. I, I don't. I'm not a great. I I really don't like that. It's pretty. It's pretty horrendous. And I. Uh, but do I blame these people? Yes, I could probably do. Those some of those guys, I think they're pretty unscrupulous. Um, yeah. And you know, look, I, I'm owed a fair amount of money by people in Vegas. Some of some of them, look, they know they owe me. They know that they they know they owe me this money. Um, and I don't, you know, I still look. I still see them when where I go to Vegas. It never. I don't bring it up anymore. I've just stopped bringing it up. Um, I should probably. You know, some people say you should out them, but I don't, you know, most of them have already been outed anyway. 
Um, I don't like that side. I'm not sure whether that's always uh, associated with addiction. I think that's just associated with being yeah. a bit of a dog. I think some of these people are real dogs. But there are other people who, who owe me money who remind me that they owe me money, but they're skinned. You know, they're, yeah. they're literally on their, they're just skinned. You know, they're sitting on the steps of the rear whenever I turn up to, in Vegas and I put them into satellites. Everybody, everybody puts them into satellites. You know, we all, you know, I'm not alone. You know, there are, you know, maybe 10 people who will put them into satellites. And, that, you know, we can name them. And, you know, you know well, I, I, we're not going to name them, but, they're, they're, you know, there are four, five, six of them, all of whom I will do because, because I trust them and I like them. And they've also provided me with huge amounts of, entertainment over the years you know yeah you know you know the, there are some the one particular player who when we were when we were playing at binions he used to he used to drink a lot and he used to make me laugh so so much you know when he was drunk and we were playing sort of single table satellites to get into the main event fucking hell he was a funny guy i don't mind just paying him i did i'll give him sort of 215 dollars or 500 dollars to go and play a satellite I've never, he's never, he's never won. Uh, or if he, <laughs> look, if he, if he's told me he's never won, I don't know. I'll tell you a funny story about somebody and I'm not going to mention their name because I don't think it's right. But I was at the, some people know this story and will know who it's about. But um, I was at the Bellagio uh, and I'd won a, I'd, I was playing in a big a cash game. But I won a big, a big pot. This is going back 10 years, I think. I won a big pot. I think it was about $120,000. It was a big game. Yeah. But anyway, I won it. I thought, fuck it, I'm going to go for a cigarette. So I went for a cigarette. And I went to the bar. You know the bar at the Bellagio in the sports book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to, I went to sit there. And anyway, I saw this friend of mine from London uh, there sitting there. And looking really dejected. He didn't know that I just won this money. He was looking really dejected. And I went and said, what's wrong? He said, I've just, I'm skinned, I've just blown. He said, I've blown all my bankroll, uh, you know, on the poker and on the dice. And, you know, fucking, I'm having a really bad trip and horrible. And I said, well, look, I said, here is, here's, I'm going to, here's $1,500. There's a $1,500 tournament, hold tournament tomorrow at the Rio. Here's 50, go and enter that tournament, play your heart out and, you know, do you know really you, you're going to do really well i really think you're going to do well in it he said he said thanks a lot john you know really thank you very very much okay he uh he goes and plays the tournament he wins the fucking tournament okay so he gets a bracelet and he oh, wins wow. like <laughs> and he wins like two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. all right i had i had to chase him to get the fifteen hundred dollars back right yeah, yeah. yeah. And it never occurred to him to give me anything more than yeah. that. And he reluctantly gave me the fifteen hundred dollars, and he just won two hundred and thirty thousand. I mean, it's seriously. This is this, and I, I kind of thought when I just, I kind of laughed at that. I just thought, you fucking, how can you live with yourself? You know, how can you yeah. seriously live with yourself and be that type of person? Sure, we haven't done it. I, I haven't mentioned anything about a deal i just yeah. was helping a guy who was just literally skin and so i was just helping somebody out but really they should have they should have really you know you, you know you know what i'm saying yeah um so, yeah how do you uh <laughs> how do you feel after that is that guy is he written off in your book uh yeah he was pretty much written yeah. off after that yeah, yeah, completely. But yeah, he was, and uh, and st and still is, uh, mm. very much uh, to this day. Yeah. Uh, even though I occasionally bump into him, mm. uh, but it's a it's all one sided, unfortunately, with him, and it has been all all uh, all uh, with everybody. He's the same with everybody. It's not just with me. I, you know, I promise you. So yeah. uh, it doesn't. It's that something that he that he has to live with. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I think it's very, it's a very important distinction with these people, um, where you you do have a lot of guys that, you know, the human psyche is very complicated, and some people they do have addictions or whatever, but they're generally pretty decent people. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. sometimes it ends up being the same thing where you know someone doesn't pay you back or someone owes you money or someone robs from you, and whether it's because they're a bad person or because they're an addict, 
you know, mm-hmm. sometimes it's the same result. But uh, yeah, I definitely think uh, you have to draw, you know, there is a distinction to be made between people who are just, you know, kind of slimy, sneaky people and then people who are just, you know, sick in, in a different way and suffer from addiction. And a lot of their actions are based on that. Yeah. And you have to, I think I have to, I do certainly feel uh, an element uh, uh, sympathy for for, yeah. for that, you know, yeah. but um, you know, there's kind of a limit to my uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that, that pushed it over the limit. I think yeah. I like I like to help people if I can, um, and I'm the sort of person that if I borrow, if I and have this is this is whenever I borrow more money off people. Um, in a game, if I run out of cash in a game and I borrow five, five, ten, ten k or twenty k, if I lose it, then I have to. I, I actually have to pay that person. But I, I have to. I'm, I've driven across town just to go to a casino to pay somebody back that money the next day because I don't. It burns a hole in my, you know, in my conscience if I don't get it out of the way. I have to, even though I have no intention of going to the casino. I'll go there, pay them back, and then go back home again. You know, um, because I've got to, I just have to write it, write it off. If I say to somebody I'm going to pay them back, I pay them back. Um, yeah, that's just the type of person I am. I couldn't live. I actually couldn't live with myself not being, not doing it. I would never borrow money I couldn't afford to pay back ever. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I, I feel very. Even scary. from a casino, you know, annoyingly, even from a casino. You know, even as I've had to send checks to casinos in Vegas, but I've never, I would never play with a marker I couldn't afford to pay back. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's just it, it can be enforced. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> That's, um, yes. As a, fr- a friend of mine once said to me, uh, Joe, another big, big, big gambler, um, but you know, always, you know, very, very quick to pay money. He always, or you know, I've, I've never had any problems with him. But uh, as he yeah. said to me one day, he says, "Why am I the only fucking idiot that's paying back all these people, Joe? All these other guys aren't paying back the casino, pay back other players. Why am I the only idiot doing it?" But yeah. You, uh, yeah, I think whatever. It's true, whatever. but I think we are the only idiots doing it sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I'd rather be that idiot, I think, than uh, than having have to live with uh, not yeah. paying people back. Yeah, um, I, I remember, yeah, in, in uh, Bar- Barry Greenstein's book, which I, I think is a, a very underrated book, something that kind of stands the test of time as far as kind of poker, you know, how to how to live in the poker world, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, a lot of that, a lot of what he says is. Um, even if you're costing yourself EV or you're costing yourself equity or whatever, you have to do what you're comfortable with and what helps you sleep at night. And uh, I, I think it's just when you get into this world, it's it's a lot easier just kind of job pay money. I think you have, or, yeah, you get you get. I think you also get quite a good. You know, the thing is, it's about reputation too. I had a five grand bet with somebody in Vegas. Borrow, uh, who could borrow a million dollars before the other person? Who would be the quickest to do it? Yeah. It was a stupid bet because I uh, he was he was American, and I, and I was British. It was a really stupid bet because he knew everybody in Bobby's room, and I kind of knew a few people in Bobby's room. So, and he he managed to get it a lot quicker than I did. I think it took me like an hour and a half or something. And wow. he, he, he got it like in a, like an hour. I can't remember. He was literally in, in hardly any time at all. It was stupid, and we had to be sitting back at the table with the actual chips. Oh wow. Mean? With, yeah, with the with the cranberries. So it wasn't it wasn't like okay, yeah, I can get it on credit. We had to be sitting there with the cranberries at the table, you know. Um, That's incredible. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I lost I lost five grand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was really stupid. But that's the thing is that's about that's about trust, you know. That's about people trusting you and knowing that you're good for your you're good good for it, you know. I know other people who've tried to sell me, you know, bad debts, you mm. know, people in. You know, or wanted me to buy bad bad debts off people, off sort of European players. Yeah. Uh, and uh, especially, you know, when I was running EPT, I used to get a lot of that stuff. You know, a lot of people would travel without money, and I would I would end up um, personally lending players from America, you know, huge amounts of money, sometimes two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. euros, uh, things like that. But the tr- the problem is during the you know during the early you know noughties no 2000 yeah yeah during that that decade 
there was so much money floating around the um, the is it the poker business, you know. Yeah. You would see, you know, especially when it came to like full tilt players. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what's you know the um, who was the guy who was the guy with the beard, not Howard Ledbetter. You know, the guy who ran ran full tilt. Chris so, Chris Ferguson. No, no, no. The other, the, the actual businessman. The CEO. Right, Ray, Ray, Ray Bittar. Yeah, Ray, R R anyway, Ray Bittar's brother, who looked exactly yeah. like Ray Bittar, would literally be at the fucking Rio with a bag full of, 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 of Bellagio cranberries and, and five, you know, and, flat, you know yeah. and giving them out, fucking giving them out, literally like they were 10 p. He would let you, you, you see him i would see him standing there just giving money to people you know like this yeah. and there was no there was never a, i just i remember when well, you know when i i saw that once and i thought this Lovely this is right something's going to go wrong here you know something this 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 is this you can't run a business like that you know it, you, you can the, the difficulty was everybody was doing it it wasn't just you know yeah. it wasn't just full tilt there were other people it was very difficult to get money in you know you, so a lot of but bellagio chips became like the currency yeah? and so people would come to Monte Carlo and they pay with you know they would pay with Bellagio chips to enter European EPT events you know um, yeah. so I would end up with you know suitcases full of uh, I'd have all sorts of currency you know I'd, I had to, the way I ran that was ridiculous at times I had um you know because we ran because of the cash the debt the cage was down at the uh, sporting D there, right by the Monte Carlo Bay Hotel, right? Because because uh, people would buy in with cash in those days, or pretty much all the time. I would have like millions of euros in in cash in my hotel room, okay. And and I would go shit. So and and but I had a, you couldn't open a bank account uh, in Monte Carlo as a company then. So all I could do was I set up a. You know, I had a deposit account at the main casino in yeah. Casino Square, so I had to take the money up there. Now, most people would get a Brinks mat and get get it taken up there and deposited up. Not me. No, I had the I, I had this revelation. I had the great idea. What I would do would get the prize money. Okay, this is the prize money from the tournament. Okay. There would be like two million euros. I I I would put it. I would get dressed in my squash kit, and I put it in a squash bag. Okay. And I'd, I'd have a squash racket sticking out of the, uh, the squash bag and it would have like two million euros in the, in the squash bag. And I'd walk up to the, uh, I'd walk up to the main casino square and, and because they knew, they let me into the casino anyway, because they knew what I was doing. <laughs> and, uh, and that was, I mean, these were crazy. These were just stupid times. I mean, crazy times. Uh, I, you know, I mean, and and I think people used to think that that was, but it was the only way of doing it at that time. It was the only way of actually getting, there was, I never had any, look, there was never any intention. I could never have lost that money. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I even though I played, even though I pl was playing blackjack, you know, what I would do is I'd send over like sort of 50,000 of my own money. And then on that deposit, there would also be like, you know, whatever the prize money for the casino. And, uh, it was all very, very. It was all very, very strange at the time. But it was, it was totally above board and totally honest. It was yeah. just a very strange way to deposit money, <laughs> the prize money from the tournament. It had to be kept somewhere, you know. Yeah. Insane, absolutely insane. But it all balanced out in the end, and everything, you know. That we were never short. Whenever I was doing the bookkeeping, we were never short. Unfortunately, that wasn't always the case with other people. Sadly. Hmm. Um. Yeah, uh, I suppose kind of in the in the current day now, you're um you're involved with uh, involved with party poker. Um, the kind of the old kids in the block are now the the new kids in the block on the block. Uh, where where do you think the medium medium to kind of short to medium term future for uh, party poker? What do you think that looks like? I think online it's good. I think it's good online. I think they 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 um a lot of the live tournaments are just transferred to online now um and yeah. you know they're hitting the guarantees and it's doing quite well uh, patrick put leonard put up a sort of post the other day on twitter saying that he thought that actually the it, it was unsustainable and that uh people yeah. you know might start to go skin because there were just too many um too many high stakes events 
all going after another, all one after the other, after, and that people, it just was unsustainable. Mm -hmm. um, that may well be the case, I don't know, but I think that people, you know, people need to be careful, you know, uh, and not, uh, you know, not buy into, you know, literally people need to be careful when they're in lockdown and when they're at home playing, you know, in all these tournaments, not and only playing within their uh, budget and their bankroll. And so, mm. uh, because it's very tempting to just throw 5K, you know, 5K into the tournament, um, hoping that you're going to win it. We've all done it. I know I've I've done it, and I don't. I tend not to do it now. Yeah, uh, I, I I did it the other day. <laughs> now I play the you know, but but uh, I don't. I don't like doing it. I'd rather satellite in. I really yeah. I really prefer to satellite. In. And if you can do it, great. Yeah. So the online yeah. scene is, is 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 thriving. I think for for all online poker sites at the moment. Yeah, um, and I think it will continue to do so. I don't see me personally. I don't see casinos look. They're going to try and open again. They have to try and open again. Yeah, but and I think that slot, you know, slot machines. People will go and play slot machines, and they'll be sanitised and everything like that. It's fine. I don't see poker getting back. Yeah. Don't I just don't see live poker starting until either the virus is destroyed globally which it's not going to be, I don't think, because that takes a, a huge effort by every single government to have absolute yeah. transparency when it comes to testing and the number of people that have it and their travel, you know, it's re that's really, really difficult to achieve. So you're never going to know who you're sitting next to, whether they have it or whether they've had it or whether, you know, whether they're immune. What, what are you going to do? You're going to have people that, have, the, only, the only thing I think possible is that some sort of, covid passport which says that you have mm. had it and therefore the only people that could possibly play in poker tournaments are, are, are people that have actually had it um or playing even cash games or entering into enter into a casino i don't know i don't see i don't see how it's going to work otherwise unless a vaccine happen, you know happens but i don't i'm i think it's odds against the vaccine being uh, made unfortunately so the bleak, for live poker, I think the future is bleak. Yeah, uh, very bleak indeed. Um, and I, I really, I really miss it, and I really want to play again live. I really, really miss it. Um, and I'm sure I know I'm not alone. Yeah. But yeah. having said that, I couldn't. I wouldn't. I personally, age sixty-two, with a few underlying lung disorders from smoking for forty years um would probably not i would definitely not go and play in a to go into a casino and play yeah. in a, a poker t t event I, I sit at a poker table i just wouldn't do it yeah um, and I, I won't do it for i, I suspect for a long time mm. sadly uh, it really saddens me because i i enjoy it you know a lot yeah um yeah it's a pity and i think it, it's very hard to see how it's not going to be one of the the last things to come back into society uh so you're um you're you're, you're playing you're playing a bit more uh online uh these days i see um yeah you... i play a lot online yeah yeah what do you mean you see <laughs> you uh, see i um <laughs> well the fact when i was preparing uh yeah when i was contacting this week you said uh yeah, we can do Thursday uh, as long as I don't run deep in anything. So, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're I, really, I really like, I really like playing. I don't, I don't get given a huge budget anymore to play. I, I, a lot of the time, I'm playing with my own, with my own money, you know. But you know, but I, you know, I get given a little bit of sort of, you know, money to play uh, some tournaments, but it doesn't go very far. And so I, I often find myself uh, playing with, you know, my own money. And also, I like to play cash online. I do, I do look. I don't do too badly on online uh, these days. I'm, I'm, I kind of. I'm not saying I've sussed it, but I, I kind of know what people are doing. I've, 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 I did find myself last year spending a lot more time studying my game. You know, and looking at looking looking at, at people, looking at sort of Jonathan Little's site, looking at uh, Run It Once, looking. You know. I spend a lot of a lot of time studying and looking at videos on you know, you know the, the you know Sam and, and Luke Greenwood and um, Jason Coombe and Jonathan Little and, you know all these players and just learning a lot about the game. 
yeah i enjoy i enjoy that it's a real challenge and i think my game's improved as a result uh i also like the my game facility on po party poker i don't know if you're aware of that do you know it uh, no, i'm i'm semi familiar with it i i it's basically it's kind of a well a fellow country kind of over tracker but yeah, yeah it is, it's like that uh, anyway my game was created and what it does is it effectively tracks your it tracks your game and it it, it points out the weaknesses in your game and it's great i really it scores yeah. you it gives you a scorecard so you'll have like a a b b you know my my showdown is like d you know i get on showdowns i get like a d or an e you know it's really yeah. really bad you know uh so and it, you know it'll tell you if you're three betting too much or if you're or if you're not doing it and it's really good because you can make little tweaks to your game uh if you want to if you want to do that you can do it you can improve yeah and you know this there comes a time when all poker players all losing poker players are going to say actually I'm fucking fed up of losing i actually would like to try this winning thing <laughs> you know <laughs> this winning thing seems to be even more enjoyable the guys that win seem much much happier than the guys that lose you know but this is a thing and this is a mental thing though too because i honestly used to believe i was happier when i lost you know i slept better when i lost i was a be nicer person when i lost you know i was yeah. you know and and trying to become a winning player and still be you know still feel good about it is 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 is, is, is messing around with your psyche you know you have to mess around with your head and you have to stop um you have to learn not to tilt you know you have to learn not to steam mm. uh, and not to gamble because sometimes i play and i really like to gamble with any cards at all you know I, I, you my v, v pick will literally be 100 percent. i'll play yeah. with every, every, any fucking cards you know um on a on a bad day on bad days and sometimes i win on those those days because you just don't know how to play against her you know because i literally i can i can hear every flop any f flop seven deuce nine you know that's me i'm all over it you know yeah. with because i mean I, i'm playing every fucking so you know i'm learning to be look I'm, I'm learning about ranges i'm learning about flop textures i'm learning about i'm trying to learn about things which i literally hadn't thought about before um, and I find I'm finding that fascinating, and I've got the time to do it now as well. <clears throat> um, and you can learn a huge. You don't have to play too big, you know. You can play small, and still yeah. um, and and pass the time. So I'm enjoying that. And I tried to do that. We combined it with Zoom early on. I you know I, I invited I invited players on cash games to Zoom, so uh, we would have like six or six players all with, on Zoom and. Uh, but it kind of worked for a while, but then the problem was is that a lot of these guys were multi tabling so even people that were actually very normally very talkative, like Sam Grafton, you know you'd be on zoom with him and he'd be he'd fucking shut the fuck he'd, he'd never say a word because he's multi tabling about seven yeah. eight tables you know on online, and no he's not like when he's in a live game where well, he never stops fucking stops talking, really entertaining, I love the guy. But then you have him on Zoom playing uh, cash. Forget it. It's no point because he's he's playing in about hundred tournaments or something like that, and he hasn't got time to talk. And the same applies to pretty much everybody I play I, I play against, uh, unless it's a very specific uh, cash game where people are. I know that people are only playing one. They're only playing that game. Because, yeah, yeah. You know, they're just not. They're not pros. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, what what do you think the future holds for you, John? Uh, both kind of inside yeah, poker and outside uh, poker. I don't know. Um, I want to. I look. I want to do. I just. I want to do something else. You know. I want to. Yeah. I like the idea. You know. I, I did. I did direct something for Netflix and ITV a couple of years ago, uh, which I so I was trying to get back into directing um, before the. Uh, the party poker gig came along um i still like to do i still like to do that i suspect maybe one day i'll actually pull my finger out and write uh, a screenplay of my own and try to get money raise money and direct it it won't be about poker i don't think it'll be about something probably more personal maybe about my maybe about my life i don't know you know I'm not mm. saying i've had a fascinating life it's been sort of interesting i'm really I'm very happy with I'm very, very lucky. You know, I, I, you know, I'm very lucky that I managed to 
stop drinking and get, you know, and I was very lucky that my, you know, Charlotte, my current, my, my wife, came back to me even because she knew me when I was drinking and you know we, we met when we were like 20 in our early 20s like 21 22 and um we bumped into each other again when I was like 28 after I'd stopped drinking and that was lucky and so we ended up getting married and having kids which is which is brilliant so those things those things are good I can tick off those boxes done that uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think I'm a I don't think I'm a brilliant dad I, I'm all right you know uh, maybe I tried to be too much of a mate to to my son, but I, uh, you know, I still, um, you know, I I hope I'm all right. I think they I think they kind of like me, like they like, like me. I'm not sure whether they respect me that much. Well, what, I yeah. think they, one I of think my they mothers, like me. yeah, what, you what? Mother saying uh, one of his sayings to to me, my brother was that. Uh, you don't have to be a good parent. You just have to be good enough. So that was the, yeah, that was yeah. the bar he was setting himself. And he was happy that he was good enough. Yeah. I think that's all you can do. You can only do your yeah. best, you know, and that's, uh, I think I, best. I could have, you know, maybe I could have played football with them more. That's, that's a lot of grief I get from Charlotte and the boys about me not being around to play football with them mm. uh, when they were kids. Uh, you know, um, what, what does the future hold? I don't know, but it's not, the story isn't over yet. So I still, I still want to, the thing is, it's interesting, this job, because it's like, it's like, uh, the reality of it is I don't really do very much, is that I'm very much a figurehead, um, which I don't like. I really don't like that. You know, I think the, pr the problem is, is, you know, you've got these people who are in charge, like, you know, like uh, Tom Waters and Rob Young, and, uh, you know, the, they, you know, they, they're in charge of like party poker and party poker live and stuff like that. Yeah. And okay. Yeah. Initially in the first year, yeah, I, I would make suggestions. They would listen or they pretend to listen. Uh, and then I, suddenly I realized that it was more often they were pretending to listen. They knew exactly what they wanted to do themselves anyway. Uh, and then after a while, I just thought, actually, they don't really want my input. You know, they just really want my name and my uh uh the fact that i created the ebt you know th that's that's what they want they don't want much more than that they you know they can just send out emails with my name on the bottom of them you know and it's yeah. that's fine okay just here, here's you know I'll, here's a check you know it's not look it's not a huge amount of money they pay me but uh it's it's fun i enjoy it and i like i really like the people who are involved but the problem is I'm not busy. Do you know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not busy. So I need to. I need to do something. So I've been doing a lot of. You know, I've, I've been like stripping motorbikes down. I've been. You know, I, I like doing things with my hands. I like. I, I. I would like to. I'd actually really like to be like a car mechanic or something like that. I'd really like to be a good uh, car mechanic. So I might do. I might do that. But things. It's very difficult to learn new things now because of social distancing because of covid you know True. i wanted to learn how to sail a boat I, I i thought that would be a nice thing to do you know there's lots of things i still want to do it's not like i've got a, a bucket list or anything but i think i i want to keep moving forward i think you always need to keep looking ahead i think you always need to have goals and ambition because once you, when you start looking behind i think it's a russian expression actually so once you start looking behind that's when you that's when you're old you know that's when you feel yeah, old. Yeah. If, you, or if you're always looking ahead and you're always got plans and you're always thinking about what you're doing next and not and never looking behind, then you will always keep young. Uh, and I still feel incredibly young. You know, I still feel emotionally probably about 27. Um, and and uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't, that doesn't worry me. You know, I'm not, a, you know, it's not, I, you know, I, I like, I enjoy life and I really like people. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting back uh, yeah. together with people. You know, mm -hmm. I miss I miss people a lot. You know, yeah, um, yeah, uh, John. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for for joining me today. Uh, I could I could talk to you all day, but um, I suppose we better uh, we we better limit it at some point. But uh, yeah, I've turned the light on. It got dark while we were yeah. <laughs> Um, thanks a million. Well, really good. Look, good luck with the podcast, and I hope it goes really, really well, and you get lots of um, uh, listeners. 
Uh, I hope so. I hope so. Uh, having having in- interesting conversations like this uh, will surely help. So uh, I, I hope so too. Uh, if people want to find out more about you, Twitter, I assume, is the, the best bet. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm, most of my tweets are usually about Barney Boatman. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, I do, I'm vocal on Twitter. I'm on Facebook, but I, I'm, I very rarely log into Facebook. Um, they can certainly find out more about me there or what's going on. But yeah. uh, I'm a fairly private person, really. Mm. <laughs> but, I do, but I do enjoy people. I don't shout from the mountains about what's going on. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, you're 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 happy to share as well. Which uh, Joe, when, yeah. when, when, when we get you talking, it's it's good that you're happy to share. So uh, I think uh, people appreciate it, and it's definitely uh, enjoyable. Um, thank Thanks you good. to thank you to everyone for joining us as well. Uh, if you're enjoying the content and want to help me out, I'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, if you think others might enjoy the content, please spread the word. The podcast can also be found on Spotify now. The easiest way to find uh there is by searching jamie flynn uh john thanks a million and uh enjoy enjoy the rest of lockdown good luck and thank you very much for having me